Wallingford Work Camp 2018, a project that's being run by First Congregational Church. Hello, my name is David Wells, and I'm here with Lorraine Westervelt and Connor Filkins. We're representatives of Wallingford Work Camp 2018. Our project is basically to work on 60 homes without any cost to the homeowners and repair them on July 8th to the 14th this coming summer. Our goal is to help as many people we can uh, with low income, disabilities, and also senior citizens who are in need of home repair. Lorraine, would you like to give us a little bit more background? So the way the work camp works is that about 450 people, youth and adults, come from around the country. They'll be broken down into groups of six and then go out to those 60 individual homes. And so one home they might be painting at, another home they might be doing porches, they're doing whatever it is that they're doing during that week to repair that person's home. The cost is free to the homeowners because as a team, we're doing the fundraising to raise $25,000 to pay for those material costs. Okay, and we have a, a nice picture here of a before and after for mobile home skirting, which is one of the many projects we'll be working at. It was skirted, it was painted, and they built an right. entrance deck. Right. So that was actually three crews working on that three one crews. home. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very striking, the, the before and the after photos. Connor, this was your idea um, from, from your vast experience with group mission trips. Um, you must have thought, you know, well, I'm going to have to find a place for over 400 people to spend the week in camp. Mm -hmm. and we're going to have to raise uh, what we decided was $25,000 in these uh, difficult times to raise money. Mm -hmm. What were these hurdles like? Were you a little daunted going into this? Yeah, it, I was coming home from my first year um, working at Staff with Group uh, in 2015. I was really jazzed coming home because I knew this was a project that we could do. And then immediately walked right into that first hurdle of finding a place to house 400 and plus youth and adults. I figured with my experience, she in high school would be the perfect place to uh, house that many um, for a camp like that. I walked into Dr. Menzo's office and pitched the idea and immediately was met with a little bit of hesitation, rightfully so, because, you know, who in their right mind would want to let 400 plus youth and adults <laughs> that you don't know walk into your school and just live there for an entire week. I think that was our biggest hurdle, mm -hmm. um, was figuring that out. Um, it took us a little while to finally pull the right strings and you know, get, um, get the right people to press the right buttons to uh, figure that out. Ellie Hazelwood, who works in the town health department, was the uh, catalyst for being able to get us over that first hurdle. She pitched this idea as a way to help the town be able to test their emergency shelter system. We uh, have a group that is a really big group coming in and would be a perfect group for her to test the capacity and the uh, ability of Sheehan High School to be used as an emergency shelter. So that was how we got over that first hurdle really. I think the, um, the thing to remember is that uh, Connor and the youth group in, in First Church has been going to other places and when we go mm -hmm. to those places you yes. use a high school and you sleep on the floor in the classroom. That concept is foreign to somebody who hasn't gone and slept on the floor in the classroom mm -hmm. um, and understand that. When you think about an emergency shelter, there are people that are going to be sleeping on the floor in the gym or the classroom or whatever it is that's provided for the shelter, mm -hmm. which is why it's a match. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's good we're doing something for the town of Wallingford well uh, through this project. Let's get to the stories. There have to be quite a few heartwarming <laughs> stories through the years. Connor, Absolutely. do you have a few? Yeah, I've definitely got a few. I worked with uh, this one woman named Donna. We were working on her trailer home, putting some skirting up. After getting to know her a little while, she uh, let us know, you know, she doesn't have a really great relationship with her neighbors. And so we were kind of like aware of that, trying not to, you know, infringe on their property. Each day we do devotions with our crew. We sit down for lunch, uh, we open up our little devotional book, and we go through like a little guided program to kind of open us up a little bit more spiritually. And that day, both Donna and her neighbors joined us. And that was a really cool moment of healing for them. That was the first time that they had ever sat down together 
and kind of talked. By the end of the week, they were acting like they had been best friends for years. So that was really cool to see. That's wonderful. Your, your son, Gabe, went on a mission trip last year. It was the first time he went. What was his experience working with six people he'd never met before? Yeah, that's part of the program. You're not grouped with people from your own youth group. He just had a, a great opportunity to meet some people and work with them in a, a different environment. He came home with a, with a great deal of different clothes than he took. <laughs> I, I found out he made friends with an a archer. Um, who had done archery contests, and he had a shirt from one of his events. And I saw this, and I said, Gabe, I, I don't know where this shirt came from. <laughs> and, I, and I don't see two pairs of your shorts. What happened? <laughs> but if you're going to be spending you know, all this time in a kind of cramped in a, in a small room with a bunch of kids, that's one way you get mm -hmm. to know them very quickly. There's very little floor <laughs> space in those rooms. Gabe loves the people, and he, he really enjoyed getting to know other mm -hmm. kids. And I think he, he demanded to go back this, this coming <laughs> summer, and he got angry at it and turned the deposit in and in a timely fashion timely enough for him so he, he's good now yeah but, uh, yeah the people make it such a great experience that's what just keeps me going back is all the friends that you make you know mm -hmm. as a camper and then especially um, working as staff it becomes a really close-knit group family and you meet so many people from all over the country and they're just there with a servant's heart that they really want to be out there and being with them in that community is just such such a great feeling and such an empowering feeling too i love it now lorraine did you have a story about your daughter um yeah my daughter went when she was going from eighth grade to ninth grade so that was her first summer going and before she went on the trip she was painfully shy I mean, if she needed ketchup in a restaurant, she had to get somebody else to ask. She certainly couldn't ask the waitress. And on the trip, um, she was excited because it turned out that her crew was assigned to work on the front of the house, the same house that my crew was working on the back of the house. So she was like, oh, I'm going to be able to rely on you, Mom. But somehow during the Sunday night, because on Sunday night you meet your crew for the first time, so you get told who you're working with for the week. Mm -hmm. And they do kind of an icebreaker kind of thing. And she was so comfortable with the kids that were in her group, an adult that was in her group, that she decided she wasn't going to be shy anymore. <laughs> and she just decided she was going to just talk to people and she was mm -hmm. going to be just fine. Mm -hmm. By Wednesday, when, when it was time to share something you don't know about me, you know, tell, tell us something we don't know so far about you, she shared that she was shy. And everybody was like, no way, you're shy. Because, you know, she'd been talking with everybody. She'd been talking with the resident. She'd been talking with the resident's kids. Um, and so they turned and looked at me, and I said, yeah, I, I don't know this girl that's here. Um, this, is a, this is a really incredible mm -hmm. change. And it wasn't just in that environment, because she's now, she's done talks at church. She's done talks other places. Mm -hmm. um, and it really changed her life. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's yeah. awesome. So the personal growth opportunities there are really something. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. That I mean, just watching her grow um, from my vantage point has been something really cool. And then, you know, just for, you know, me and my brother going on these trips, you know, we learn, like, these skills to, like, I've never built a porch before I went on one of these trips. And now, you know, that experiential learning, that home improvement um, skills that you learn, are they're, they're lifelong. And to be able to go into a week kind of not having a lot of confidence in yourself and then, you know, seeing, you know, how far you can stretch your abilities is something that I think is really cool for the kids, too. And definitely was cool for me when I was uh, both as a camper and a staff member. Mm -hmm. I remember walking up to this one house and the porch was kind of dilapidated. And so my crew had to tear down the porch and build a new porch. At the end of the week, one of the crew members said, would you take a picture of me in front of this porch? And I was like, oh, sure. He goes, nobody's going to believe that I actually built this porch. <laughs> yeah. He was just so pleased to have learned this new skill. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I believe I, I read in the Record Journal uh, a nice piece uh, Bailey Wright did. Um, Karen Blakesley spoke of a woman who needed a wheelchair ramp and had been stuck in her house for two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they built the ramp... Um, and she got out and she was able to go and have a, a nice dinner with the people 
who built the ramp for her. And it must have been a very, very heartwarming moment for her and for the group. And just a sense of accomplishment um, that I see in this is, uh, it's just very wonderful. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. Um, yeah, talking about having very few skills to, to apply to this, my son is not exactly Mr. Fix-It yet, <laughs> um, and they have you fill out a sheet of paper about what, you know, what you're able to do and what you feel capable at, and, mm -hmm. and Gabe saw uh, you know, painting as one of them, and he said, well, does finger painting count? <laughs> I, I don't think that'll get you far, but uh, mm -hmm. he helped out with the, the mobile home skirting, and um, I'm sure he's a much more accomplished painter now, and, mm -hmm. and he feels good about that. He, he did learn something that'll mm -hmm. help him down the road. Yeah. So. Sunday the campers arrive and it is just one big organized chaotic event that's so much fun and so energetic and we have a crew manager on our four person summer staff that takes all of that information so the sun, or the survey that Gabe filled out mm -hmm. uh group gets that inputs it into a database which you know that how that works is beyond me <laughs> but it will spit out all of these crews matching every single skill level hmm. to the projects that are available, making sure that, you know, the really um, skilled carpenters are going to those difficult wheelchair ramp sites mm -hmm. and those skilled painters are going to the really difficult painting sites. And it helps us as staff be able to gauge, um, you know, where best would these less experienced campers be able to get their feet wet, um, be able to have that experience of growth while not feeling overwhelmed, you know, not having to be that person mm -hmm. on the site that has to lead. Because, you know, it's something that's very intimidating, especially to first-time campers. Uh, we had a woman at one of my camps that I worked at where she had really no prior skills. Um, and she dove in, was able to get one of those easy painting sites and she was, I, I remember talking to her at the beginning of the week and she was a nervous wreck. <laughs> and by Friday, she had the biggest smile on her face. She was just so relieved that, you know, she was able to be the adult on the crew and be able to lead her kids through and that the kids were able to help her out as well. One of the things I found fascinating was that sometimes the youth in the group is the most experienced person. Mm -hmm. Like if it's a first time adult mm -hmm. who's never done the painting before, they might put in that group a couple of experienced youth mm -hmm. painters. And so that among the group, there mm -hmm. are experienced and inexperienced. With yeah. that um, professional carpenter, you would put a few people that have never done anything with carpentry. By the next year, those people will have some experience that they can bring to the next year's Absolutely. Um, camp. Absolutely. And group is very, group mission trips is very much um, of the idea that it shouldn't be the adults that are directing the work on the project. We're very much um, of the idea that we, we want to empower the kids. Mm -hmm. We want them to be able to make the decisions, be able to say, all right, this is how, this is how we're supposed to do things. That way, you know, they come out of it feeling, again, empowered and feeling that boost of self-confidence. Sure, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, and I recall that Kathy Cunliffe, um, our, our reverend, went to uh, this, this past one in West Virginia. She got put on a porch repair. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Porch repair and painting. And yeah. painting. She sees this project and her for, first thought <laughs> was, who is going to help me with this? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, coincidentally, or maybe not so coincidentally, after what you said about how these projects are assigned, Mike Torres from our church was nearby. Well, uh -huh. also the crew that she had were all um, older campers mm -hmm. and had skills in how to do the porch repair. Um, so in addition to having Mike Torres, who was is a carpenter by mm -hmm. trade, um, nearby, she had the crew members that could do the work. Right. Um, so that mm -hmm. that that makes a huge difference it all comes together and great great planning by group mission trips to, to get that off the ground i'm sure yeah. the other thing that group does is that they have red shirts who are skilled people um contractor mm. types this is worth who, explaining yeah. who yeah. go around to diff <clears throat> different sites mm. so that um, they might be assigned to eight sites and they go around and so when they come to your site if there's a question you don't know how to do this 
um, they would know how to do it or they can find the answer mm -hmm. for you on how yeah. to do it. Yeah, um, we call them site coaches. <clears throat> uh, that was part of my responsibility as a materials manager for group was uh, leading that team of site coaches, assigning them to different sites based on their skill levels and their previous professional history. Um, and those guys, uh, some of the hardest problems that we have run into at camps, I ask them and they just like that, come up with the best solution for some of these most difficult problems. And they are so, so willing to give extra time. They are there to be there for the camp, be there for the kids, and be there for the residents. I remember we had one, uh, one house where we ended up finding a lot of rot on one of the walls that we were supposed to be painting. And rather than just doing the Band-Aid job, uh, we decided, you know what, we're gonna do this the right way. And the site coaches went on their half day off on Wednesday and they took a bunch of green board and literally replaced the wall mm -hmm. when we were only originally going to be doing painting. Mm -hmm. So they give of themselves so much and they're so invested in the work and the kids as well. The site coaches are volunteers, mm -hmm. so that they come, they've probably gone as a camper before. They see that this is something they want to get involved in. And so we, um, actually I was talking to some people that hope to come as site, site coaches to Wallingford mm -hmm. uh, to do this work. They're volunteers, the adults that are involved are volunteers, the kids are volunteers. But the thing that I think people are surprised about is that the kids that come, they actually pay to come. They pay um, for the lodging, the food, but also part of the materials, mm -hmm. the transportation costs. So they're coming to do a week of work and they're not getting paid for it, they're actually paying for it. Last year when we were on the trip, somebody stopped by and asked how much we were getting paid <laughs> and the kids explained that they paid to be able to come and do this. And the um, neighbors were kind of like, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a little unrealistic, but it's uh, again, Gabe mm -hmm. insisted that he go back this summer, and I was surprised how much fun he had um, just being in a different environment and goofing mm -hmm. around with a bunch of his friends and, and really putting his heart towards something like this. Mm -hmm. um, but, it's again, it's it's 60 homes. I mean, think, think about the difference in 60 lives Absolutely. of people who, who are just having difficulty affording this sort of work. And uh, that's, uh, that's a lot of what, what makes a big difference, mm -hmm. I think. For, uh, for me. And group has been doing this across the country for this year. They celebrated their 40th anniversary of doing home repair mission trips. They do a lot more other style mission trips now too. But across that 40 years, they've had over 450,000 participants <laughs> working over 13 million hours of volunteer labor for homes just like the ones we're going to serve in this area too. And I think that's that speaks to the experience they have and just the amount of talent in the people that they send, um, whether as redshirt staff, redshirt volunteers, or the, the campers that come. They're just amazing people that are so driven and so want to do this work for the people that need it. And it's worth pointing out that we've been on 10 straight mission trips. Mm -hmm. um, our, our church really buys into this mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Uh, yeah. And Lorraine, you've been on eight. Yeah. So you're uh, you're a volunteer uh, oh, it's, beyond the call of duty. It's a, one of the best weeks of my year mm. to go and do this every year. We've been to Pennsylvania, Michigan, New York, New Hampshire. You know, when we're at these different places, the idea that we could actually do it back home is mm. just always been so exciting. And so that's why it was so great when Connor got it going for our church. The thing I always do is I thank my resident for allowing us to work on their house. Sure. And, and I'll go up and I'll say, thank you so much for allowing us to do this. And they're kind of like looking at me like, wait a second, mm. you know, you're doing it for me. But mm -hmm. if they didn't allow us to do whatever the project was, paint their house, yeah. then we wouldn't have a place to be for that week. We wouldn't mm -hmm. have had a place to meet those other mm -hmm. people in mm -hmm. our crew and to have that good week. Sure, sure. You mentioned Gabe getting out of his comfort zone, being on this trip, and that leading to a lot of personal growth. It's the same thing for these residents. You know, they're allowing absolute strangers to come into their home and work for a week. 
And for some of them that, you know, are sh shut in and don't necessarily have a lot of contact, that is a great practice to thank them because it, it can be a very scary experience uh, up until the moment that it happens. And then finally, you know, the, the anxiety is, is released and they can let you guys do some work on their homes. It's, it's definitely, it's not just scary for, you know, a first time camper going in. It, it can be scary for a resident too. It could be. I think I underestimated Gabe and his, his willingness to go on an adventure. Mm. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. what it is for a lot of these kids, yeah. you know, just, just a chance to hang out with friends and, Absolutely. and, uh, they put in a lot of work, but there's one day a week on Wednesday, mm -hmm. if I'm correct, when, when they'll do something in the community as their off day. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if you could just Wednesday that. afternoon. Just Wednesday work. afternoon. Um, yeah. So Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, you work full days. Mm -hmm. um, but on Wednesday, you stop after lunch, and you go and do something fun. So um, they'll be looking for things in the Wallingford area that they might go to do fun. They might go to Hammonassic or Lake Compounds or hiking or mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. um, that they'll be doing in the local area. Last year we did um, one of those uh, locked and coded rooms mm -hmm. where the kids had to do a puzzle to get out of the room. So we'll be looking for things in the Wallingford area that might be interesting for the visitors to do. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. sure. Right now, one of the things that, that we're working on most is trying to find those 60 homes. Mm -hmm. And so we're doing a lot of networking. Um, the newspaper article was wonderful when the Record Journal ran that. Um, this show it hopefully will help people, though. But we've been reaching out to people in lots of ways. Um, and when we talk to people about the fact that we've got to find 60 homes, so we're looking for people that are low income, disabled, or senior citizens, mm -hmm. not all three, just one right, of those right. um, things you have to be to do it. People can apply online at mm -hmm. our Wallingford Work Camp site. They can apply in paper. We um, sent flyers home with all the school kids in Wallingford and in Meriden. Um, we've been in touch with the social services in North Haven and Meriden, and we're reaching around. Our circle that we can find those 60 homes in is 30 minute drive from Sheehan High School because when you get up in the morning, you gotta be able to get there in 30 minutes. Right. Um, so that's our geography that we're working with. We have a Facebook site as well, um, yes. which has really helped spread the word. It's really taken off. Mm. If uh, Lorraine can speak a little about that, about how our we've really gotten a lot of applications until January 31st. January 31st. Every day when I check the site to see if there's new applications, almost every day there's one. Um, we get some in the mail, we get mm. some faxed in, um, so we're, we're getting lots. And the process after they apply um, is that we have a phone conversation with them to make sure that they understand that it's one week of work in July, it's going to be done by five youth and one adult, um, that they're um, not licensed trade people, they're volunteers who are going to do this work. Um, so the phone interview is more making sure the person understands what they're signing up for, as well as finding out um, if you know where they live and what work it is, because we are limited to doing things like interior painting, exterior painting, porch repair and construction, wheelchair ramp repair and construction. They can do roofings, but we can't r rip them off. So there are specific things, some winterization kind of projects that we can do. If somebody needs all new windows in their house, that's not right. in the scope of what we can do. Mm -hmm. um, if they um, have to have their roof completely tear it off and then a new roof put on, that's beyond our scope. So the first conversation just checks to see if it's a doable project. And mm -hmm. then we go out and meet the person and, and check out the site and all that kind of stuff. And um, we actually can't commit to the work for anybody until mm -hmm. about a month before the work camp because you don't know exactly how many campers are coming yeah. right. and what the financial resources are. And so we're setting this all up um, with the idea that hopefully we'll be able to work on your site. Um, if there's a reason we're not gonna work on your site, you're 45 minutes away, we'll tell you right away. Mm -hmm. sure. But if um, there's no definite reason, then you just kind of stay in this limbo state and, uh, and explaining that to the yeah, residents. That's another one of those discomfort zone things uh, for the residents is they don't necessarily know if mm -hmm. it's going to happen or not. And 
it it is very much in flux even right up until camp um because they our our final house number that we get to work on whether it's 60 or whatever really depends on the um the registration numbers for the camp how many people that group has um recruited to come and pay and work in our community and the fundraising is a big part of the deal too which we haven't spoken much about uh, we, we have a gofundme mm -hmm. um, program that you can find through the facebook site i'm sure mm -hmm. um, you can also send checks to the church we're reaching out to try to get people to um, learn about the program and to get involved with donations and so so far we've raised three thousand of our twenty five thousand which mm -hmm. which is pretty good so far but we really need to step it up because we need to know um, how much money we have by like the end of March. Yeah. And so we have just a few more months to raise $25,000. Mm -hmm. So we've uh, decided on some fundraising activities. We're going to have some paint nights. Splat is helping us out mm. with those. We're going to do a pizza war night um, where we're going to be looking for pizza places to get involved in the pizza contest. Mm. Um, we're doing a wine and chocolate social. And um, Pat Harriman um, from Harriman Realty is uh, joined our team. Mm -hmm. And she's a really great help with our whole fundraising. Um, so we're, we're reaching out through the Con Wallingford Community Forum mm -hmm. um, in trying to get the word out about fundraising. Yeah. So any help anybody wants to give. Absolutely. Um, we heard that there are sometimes our organizations that will run a fundraiser for you mm -hmm. or a company that will run a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. um, we're hoping that somebody steps up. We're looking at foundations for fundraising mm -hmm. and also businesses um, in town. And we're looking for anyone who can just work on a voluntary basis, like to bring popsicles or whatever the case may be on a, mm -hmm. on a hot afternoon for our volunteers, for our volunteer yeah. workers, that sort of thing. Yeah, but, that's one of the fun experiences about camp is uh, when a local community buys into this camp idea and you get the the people pulling up in their minivans with a cooler in the back throwing ice pops at you on a really hot day that's yeah. just one of the really cool experiences that we can give to the campers is kind of a thank you to having them come all this way to help out our community after evening programs um there's a time for dessert and so we're looking for like groups to do dessert Mm -hmm. after evening program. Mm -hmm. love for Connor to tell us one more great story. Got oh, one more man. great story for us? One, I do. One heart-lifting story? I one do. Not ambition. only are we helping the residents that we're serving, but there are so many ways that, you know, we're just almost accidentally helping other people, too. One night we were just post-camp activities. All the kids were outside playing um, cornhole, tag, whatnot. We had this one man come up who was homeless and uh, an alcoholic and just really having a rough time. In the moments that we spent with that man, his name was Scotty, we uh, we got to know him on like a level that I don't think I ever expected. He kind of opened up to us about how hard it had been for him, how he's tried so many times to get back up on his feet. We were able to um, you know, call the pastor of a local church that we were working with and they found a place for him to go and get clean. The church actually has been helping him out um, with finding jobs and staying clean and offering him a place to uh, just feel like a human being, not be labeled as an alcoholic, but actually be labeled as a human being, which I think speaks to the greater mission of what Group Mission Trips does with these mission trips. Making the campers feel self-confident in their abilities. They're making them feel like true amazing human beings. They're making the residents feel like they are worth something, that somebody is investing in them, so their self-worth is overflowing by the end of the week. That's a great story, Connor. It's a, a great uh, moment to close on that, mm. and uh, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Connor Filkins and Lorraine Westervelt were with Wallingford Work Camp 2018. Looking forward to July 8th to the 14th for that program. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.